I think there's something in it. Two blunt tools talk tactics. I think we can make something of that. We might have to trademark it before somebody realizes that it's clever. I need to trademark uh, How Not to Die. I think close to our last show, Tony Blower, an awesome guy in uh, the States, he, uh, he texted me from the States because I put a Be Your Own Bodyguard and he said, Oh, look, Damien, just got to let you know this trademark. And, and I went, Wow, you don't ever want to um, step on someone's toes in our world from respect. Yeah. And, and yeah, literally his trademark, be your own bodyguard. So that night I jumped on and trademarked how not to die guy. And there we go. Nice work, but it's all well and good to have the trademark for, for him, but you can still be your own bodyguard, even if you can't put it on your post. I think that it's an important phrase, I think, for, for people to, for people to be aware of. And I saw a post that you put up actually, now that we're on, on that topic, that a response to one of the guys that was talking about expecting the police to protect you and all of that stuff. And both you and I have been in the police. Look, it's very much a role that we would take on if you happen to be walking by at that particular time. But I think you made a good point that, I think you made a good point that response times from police are they're quite high. And typically most fights, you probably know the stats better than me, but, but most fights are over within the first couple of minutes. Even if someone happens to make a call to the police, the chances of them getting there to save you are pretty slim. So being your own bodyguard or being aware of your surroundings is pretty important, I think. It really is. And I love that, you know, two blunt tools talk tactics because that's what I like to touch on. Exactly that, about being proactive. But when you say bodyguard, a lot of the time, a, a bodyguard's job is to protect that person, the VIP's integrity, face, dignity. Dignity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Protect their dignity out of all things. Remember Prince Charles being egged in New Zealand and things? Lucky it wasn't grenade, but dignity. Be your own bodyguard. You've got to protect your own dignity. You've got to protect your families down to actual violence that comes out. And it's about being proactive. Why shouldn't you be a little bit prepared, and, and it literally relates exactly to strong men, being prepared, I'd, I'd much rather, I think we've chatted before, spend 10000 bucks uh, to protect a $1 million uh, business from going under mm. because um, I wasn't protecting my dignity because I had a massive night out at the casino and had a couple of, of, of scantily clad women on my arms or, or something like that. You've got to be your own bodyguard. Let's think about these things. Let's get those tools. And and that's what it's, it's down to is, is proactiveness. Let's get ahead of this stuff. You're the perfect example. I could ask you that question, and I don't think I asked you the question in some shows, is, is what would you have given to go back and, and prevent what happened with good skills going forwards at, at that time? Yeah, look, I, I think um, yeah, most people will know that in my in my career, I did very well in my career, but I was battling depression and a gambling addiction. And it's funny, it's only recently I've started to really hone in that I know the gambling addiction cost me $2 million. That's in money I gave to gamble. But it ultimately cost my career and I was on very good money. So whatever earnings I could have made from that career, it cost my reputation. It took me five years to recover that. Maybe I've not recovered it in some people's eyes, but it took me five years to be comfortable with myself through that. So there's a cost there. It cost me relationships. It cost me houses. What would I have paid to not have lost all of that? You could probably write your own check. Uh, I've been quoted as saying I, I would gladly have paid $200,000 to have not lost $2 million. But I, I think the word that it probably comes from a play on the scouts of, of um, be prepared but I like to say never unprepared. You know, you don't know what the scenario is that's going to pop up. In, in my world, it's, you know, a, a mental uh, battle. And, and as you said, you, you might be out on a Friday night, you have a few too many drinks, you end up in the wrong bar and maybe with the wrong type of girls or maybe you're in a fight or maybe you just spend the weekend in bed because you've, you're hung over and you've stopped doing the things that you're supposed to do. And in your world... If you're not prepared, you, you, you don't know how to carry yourself. You don't know which side of the streets to walk on, how to how to get into your car properly. Simple things that we all think that we know, but we don't know what the scenario is going to be. But there's probably going to be a scenario that comes up in your life. 
And so the best thing you can do is prepare as best you can, which is your mind, which is your process, which is your body, so that whatever comes up, you're as prepared as you can be. You might not know what it's like for four people to jump out of a dark shadow, but if you're prepared, you're probably not walking down the place there's dark yeah. shadows, right? and, and, exactly. and you don't have to worry about it. Exactly. Uh, a guy that I respect, John Kehoe, wrote the book Mind Power, and I went to his course many years ago. <laughs> He's talking about controlling those controllables, controlling your mind. And, and um, one of the things he really said was through the, the, um, the lockdown period is, you've been here before. And you're like, yeah. what? No, I haven't. You've been here before. Yeah. You've been in a time of crisis. And what happened? You got through it because you're here. You've been in crisis, you know how to go through it, it's, it's in there. But what a clever thing you do. And I just got validation this morning about how, re how much reach I'm getting is empowering other people with a bit of knowledge, with, a, with one little thing that they can take away. I've taken so much away from what you put out there. It's brilliant. And just empowering with a bit of knowledge or a little bit of motivation, a little bit of push, a male sometimes only needs, because we're such crown guys, mm. only needs that one person to say something and they can change their direction, change their compass direction completely and they're going in the right direction, can't they? Yeah, I, was actually, I actually just got off a call where we were talking about how I, I think the world has smartened up to gurus telling them what they should do. And I think some of the things that's great about the podcast, the way that, that you run the I always get it mixed up. It's a mind and muscle, or mus straight muscle, to, straight to mind and muscle podcast. It's a, it's a real mind and muscle, right? It's a mouthful, but I thought it encapsulated. No, no, I just great. always get muscle and mind around the around the wrong way. But yeah, the, the straight to a podcast. I think they become. You have conversations, and you allow people to pick out of those conversations what resonates with them. And the, instead of saying to somebody, "This is what you should be doing," the the brain is set up to answer questions if, if we can somehow deliver our message in a question the brain will do the work for you and, and probably the best analogy I can use is you know when I was struggling with depression with gambling addiction with trying to rebuild my life every time I saw a success story or how someone had overcome struggles I'd always say yeah but that's not me that's not my story they don't they didn't come from where I came from they don't have the problems that I have yeah. and I kept looking for reasons why to, was it John Keogh you said he, he, yes. he's talking about you've been here before yep. I tried to find reasons why I hadn't been there before right like why I had that story didn't resonate with me and then eventually I, I watched a I saw a seven minute YouTube Tony Robbins saves a marriage I remember it vividly I don't remember the date but it's around 2018 so it's a long time ago and I can remember the title because it was the first time in a long while I saw somebody else's story had nothing to do with me but I managed to shift my perspective to say there is something in this that I can learn if I change the symptoms change the story change the the nuance and fit it to my story yeah. and much like if you've been in crisis at any time no matter what that crisis is no matter even if you realize you were in a crisis or not for the ladies out there that have had kids, it might not feel like it, but going through childbirth is a crisis in and of itself, not by definition that it's a bad experience, but something is drastically changing the way the body is reacting, and you have to you survive that, right? You have to, your, your mind has to be right, yeah? You've got a new child there. You have to learn to grow differently, and that's a crisis that you overcame because you, you're in a great space now, all you've got to do is shift that story a little bit to your current circumstance and you can get out of that crisis as well or move through that crisis exactly. rather than get out of that crisis. Exactly, exactly. yeah. Gee, is it, that was a great thing you did um, talking about a, a female with a baby because it is, can you imagine, I forgot the stats, 30% of your own calorie needs go towards producing milk for the baby, like food for the baby. Mm. Um, the, the, the sacrifices that you put out, and, and those are the biological ones. Let's look at the sleep ones. They say you sleep deprived for six years. You know what it's mm. like for a short period of time on selection processes and, and on, on uh, the SAS uh, Hell Week. They, 
it's, it is a time of crisis, but we just we just taking our stride. If you can at least recognise that, I I if just about every time we get the chance to say it, I think a single mum to a newborn mm. is is tougher than any special forces guy. Yeah, I I, I don't doubt that. To some respects, a mum full stop. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, there, there's, there's some shit you've got to go through as a mum that you don't really have to go through as as anybody else in the world. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I think sometimes we overlook, we do overlook our own experiences as well. We, 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 and we, you probably we, remember we, this. We do. And again, I, I'm probably full of stories these days, but I remember a time I always just thought what I did was my job, right? And it wasn't special to me. It was what I trained for. It was what I got paid to do. It didn't, you know, it's just what I grew up doing. After 18 years in the police, yeah. it's what I grew up doing. And you might have the same experience when you're, when you're in the Special Forces, then when you're in the police, now you're in the fire. Brigade. That's just what you do, right? And I remember sitting next to, I won't name him, but I remember sitting next to a very famous rugby league player, ex-rugby league player, awesome. at a lunch. Awesome. And he kept asking me about my job like it was like he was a little kid in a candy shop. Yep. And I'll be honest, I was sitting there wanting to ask him about his job because all I wanted to do was play professional rugby league, right? And and but it was it's a moment where I recognise that we do minimise our own experiences. We don't value the things that we've been through because we just think well, that's just what I do. That's just a part of. We see other people's experiences as fantastic. Yep. As, as awesome as, oh, I don't know how they ever overcame that. And we forget that we probably overcome some stuff. No matter what where you are in life or, or what you're doing, you've had to overcome something to get there. And we have to celebrate those successes or at least recognise those successes. Hmm. Um, forming what a new friend of mine, the owner of something called the Pretzel Oz, Check them out on Instagram. Amazing entrepreneur. Pretzel, um, pretzel Oz? As in the eating pretzel? Pretzels with yeah. the same. Pretzel Oz. She's an entrepreneur that started these pretzel businesses through Australia. But she said a success loop. Start a success loop. And celebrating mm. our successes when you and I are the kind of people that, that do minimise those, we might not get that success loop where it should be to, to what other people would be thinking. So, yeah, we do minimise it, which is... The strangest thing. <laughs> yeah, when you're in a time of crisis, you default to your training. You won't. You don't default to your talents. And if your training is minimising yourself, and you end up in a crisis, you will think minimally. If your training has been reminding yourself of your successes, working on your process, building your skills, then in a time of crisis, that's what you're going to revert to as well. You're going to have more of a positive mindset and. and a lot can be achieved with just a positive mindset. There's, there's a lot of successful people that didn't have the skills to be successful, but they just didn't have the ability to hear no. And, and I think that's an important point. That's where training comes in. And you know, training, that's one way of saying it. You could do mental practice, but all the, the things that you do mentally. But I'll just throw a story up there if you're going to do old man stories. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You, you we might have to change the title to Two Blunt Tools Tell Stories. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You default the level of your training slash training experience. As you said, I'm a firefighter. I've been a firefighter for 12 years. I've never pulled someone out of a burning building ever. It's, it's, it's very rare. You Normally the people are out. Hmm. I was driving home one night after a day shift. So it's like just, just uh, past sunset. It's just on dusk. Driving home last corner before I turn home, I look to my right and there's a building on fire. There's orange orange flames coming out of this. I was like, holy cow. Hit the brakes. I go to call triple zero. I went, nah. That's, I have to discount that. Tell the, the car behind me, you call triple zero. Figure out where we yeah. are. Tell them that. And I got to the back of my car because I, I was in my, my blues, the, the fire uh, uniform. Yeah. But I had a spear um, a tunic that's the the jacket, a spear jacket in my car and a balaclava and I already had my safety boots on and gloves and I just ran across there and first is everybody out? Yes, don't believe the first person. 
<laughs> as everybody yet we saw them go okay good and, and do what i could possibly do to assist with, with a hose and then as soon as the truck turned up i immediately assisted which took pressure off them all i did gary was just go back to what i would do at a job and i'm never going to come across that again i would suggest um, hmm. turning up at an actual fire then and there but I was prepared. I was proactive. I had that, that fire prep balaclava. I had gloves, so I could possibly do something more than, than than in this gear. So being proactive, being prepared, as well in physical things as what you're saying mentally for for crises and things, it just dovetails so much. This physical stuff we're talking about and the mental stuff, which actually is is is, is another thing. If you get the physical side right, the biological side, the the mental side to afford to play so much easier as well. Yeah, and I imagine in that circumstance, it wasn't until after it that you actually looked back and considered what were the things that you did, right? Because you did default to action mode. But if your action mode was to run and hide, if there are people in this life that spend their time running and hiding or making excuses or not just physically running and hiding, but mentally escaping or... Yep like me for a long time i had a, a gambling addiction yeah. that was me running and hiding you know that, and, and 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 what happens with addiction is you uh, train to run and hide so every time there's a crisis you run and hide and mm -hmm. it's not until after where you can look back and you recognize that and i'm sure you'd say this that it wasn't until after that you recognized the steps you actually took were the right steps they just come naturally because that's what your training was, right? You were, you were, as I say, never unprepared. You were prepared for anything that come up. And even though it's a scenario you weren't expecting, you were as prepared as you could have been. Yeah, 100%. And, and then further from there, and I love that you're re relating it out of that scenario to, and to other ones as well, the, the avoidance behavior of, of a stressful event is in the fire brigade, once we've done their job, then we debrief ever chat with our, our, our partner and chat as a group mm. whatever you guys want to call it but we talk it through but of course i had nobody to talk it through with because i was going home i was home 20 minutes later at that job four other fire trucks rolled up ambulance police everything it was, it was big but i had to debrief that with my partner a little bit that got me a little bit of of processing as a, as a gross way of saying it processing yep. from that yep. amygdala because i was a bit hyped up into that um, hippocampus and uh, started to take the stress away from that, any, any possible um, trauma, and then talk about it the next day. And then actually managed to, to see the investigator the next day who was doing the arson investigation, making sure that it wasn't, it wasn't arson. I actually uh, had a chat to him about what I did. He's like, oh, I'm glad I found you because I wanted to, wanted to um, have a chat about what you did. And, and that's also an important part past that, is processing. Yes. If you're the type of person that runs and hides, sure. It is what it is. I'm not judging it, but please start to get your words out. Right? Start to process mm. those things in some way so it gets away from that fight and flight fire that you had talked about so long with that gambling addiction to process mm -hmm. it into a, 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 a behavior that is uh, positive and proactive. Yeah, and in, in, in any level of peak performance, I'm fortunate enough to be studying this at the moment, but in any level of peak performance, there is always a pre, a during, and a post phase yes. uh, of the performance, irrespective of what it is. And the, the post part of it, we do often neglect, whether it's a good experience or a bad experience, whether we've taken action or we've, we've run and hid, which, to be fair, spending a lot of time doing close protection, running and hiding was the nature of the business, right? Like you... Your job isn't to stand and fight a lot of the times. Your job is to run and hide. Like, I'm, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. That's yep. a part of what the process is. Yep. But it is still to that post-activity process. Why did I run and hide? Was it the best decision? Could I have made a different decision? Is there something I can do next time to prepare me so that I can act differently? And then you get a better understanding of what you need to achieve, what you need to work on, what your mental state is there's a lot of times that after these events especially if they're very high if you don't debrief properly and come down a gentle slope you can fall off a cliff you can debrief the wrong way you can we used to call them liquid debriefs in the old days you, you'd 
know, you'd have a big job and then everyone would go out on the drink and that was the debrief for a, a traumatic circumstance. But I don't know that it's healthy because we didn't talk a lot about debriefing. I, I, I know that. I remember being a kid and they're like, oh, liquid debrief. Okay, we'd go out and I'm like, when are we going to talk about the thing? And it's like, no, 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 you'll be right, you'll be right. You know? it's, it, it is an important part if, if you want to be better and do better next time and remembering that doing better doesn't always mean taking action. It, it might mean the same result, but you have to remind yourself of the importance of how to come down from a traumatic or a crisis or a, a high emotional state. Absolutely. I, I can only think Absolutely. about a civilian, uh, going through a fall from grace, as it were, and, and you read in the paper they've gone off the rails, that they're out drinking and, or doing whatever they do. And I, I can imagine the, the hardship that is. And I never compare someone's trauma to oh, but they didn't get blown up or whatever. And you don't compare it to yours. Mm. No, no one should. But they're doing the same thing. And as funny as you're saying, I was thinking the denial is, is, is not a river in Egypt. <laughs> I, was actually, <laughs> I actually interviewed a woman who, who went down the, the, the Nile in Egypt, uh, Sarah Davis over your way, uh, to do food here a couple of weeks ago. And she was all about preparation. She's a project manager. Her yeah. first ever adventure in the world it was all preparation. She had a not a close protection guy, but a uh, security consultant. And and when they got arrested in uh, a country that I can't remember, it's in the show notes. She was she had all these things to do, all these procedures mm. that was being prepared, and it worked perfectly. It was not what they quite planned for, but it just worked perfectly. Mm -hmm. And deny, denial wasn't going to do it. It wasn't. Oh, this isn't really going to yeah. happen. And it, the preparation served them so well, being proactive, they were ahead of the curve. And again, man, when I realized what strong mend means yeah. and what you do, how awesome would it be to get in front of that now, to have people hear you speak at, at their workplace or, or whatever it is, or at a talk, or as you were on, um, on Sky News the other, the other day, and just be, be able to remember that just when they're getting into that crisis or be remember it just before it's, it's, the wheel's going to fall off. It'd be really clever, I think. I, I think again, I don't, I don't know that the solutions are different, whether it's for your physical body or for your mindset or whether it's for protecting yourself from harm out in the public uh, or from a blown-up barbecue, which I saw that you did the other week as well. But the... <laughs> The the process is the same. Maybe the tools are different, but you, you will have used and heard the analogy, and I'll probably get the actual words wrong, but train hard, work easy. But the, you, you've got to put the work in beforehand. And I think most people like to bury their heads in the sand because they don't want the uncomfortableness of going through the work. But I can promise you, having had to go through the pain, the pain of the work, is a lot less than the pain of the suffering. It's it, the, and the thing is with everybody, everybody has the opportunity to grow, to build their mindset, to build their body, to build their awareness, if they're prepared to be open to the experience. Yeah. Do you want a better life? Even if nothing ever goes wrong in your life, having a better mindset, a better body and more awareness is going to make for a better life. And as a this, this isn't just crisis management and, and the stuff that, that, that you teach, the stuff that I teach, isn't just so people can prepare for the worst, it's so they can also create the best. If I'm aware of my surroundings and I feel confident and safe, I can do more things with my life. More well, bad right? Correct. And if I, in my world, if I can help somebody create a conscious identity, and be comfortable with who they are and build a compelling vision of the future and a pathway to get there, they're far more happy, far more successful. It's not just about defending off addiction or depression or PTSD or anything like that. Mm. It is actually about peak performance. It's actually about being at your best. So this isn't just a crisis management tool. It's actually a success tool. Working on your mental health, your mental strength, your physical body, your, your your nutrition. I know I know Jess does the, the nutrition as well and, and 
the, the internal functioning, working on your awareness and your street awareness. And it's all part of the most successful version of you. That's, you know, and, and that's what we all want. And to be fair, it actually doesn't take a lot of work. An hour a day, a, a little bit here and there, a little bit more conscious, finding the right people to get around, talking to the right people, listening to the right people. And you can start slow, but more awareness, more training, your life is just better. There's that's no two ways about it. It's just better. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was on this... So Spider Up is a, is a website, and they're mainly a tactical website in the States, but he's now got the We Fight Monsters podcast, and he was interviewing me this morning, which was an absolute honour. He's got some big hitters there, so just getting me there. And, uh, he's, including he's, his, he's including his cell phone. <laughs> See, there we go. It's a good, good example of what we do. We minimise, eh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He asked a series of questions that were so tough. And towards the end, one of the questions um, he asked was, essentially, what did you do to get yourself out of the hole? What did you do to hold yourself together? And I'll never forget just how, you know, when you're in those dark times, when you're in those wobbly times, you're still trained. You still come into this, this garage on the other side, and you still got your PT. And that was that's yeah. a, a nice base. And very quickly, I realized after a few alcohol bits of numbing or denial that the sleep was off, because you, you know you're going to lie in bed till three or four in the morning, processing, uh, not processing, thoughts going off in your head, and it's just horrible. So you just numb out. I realized very quickly, hey, you need to get a handle on that. So I, I got Kirk's sleep remedy. Even though I thought I was a, a good at sleep, I wasn't taking the own advice. So I, I got the sleep and the exercise right. And that helped me so much because, dovetailing to what you were saying five minutes ago, biology creates psychology. Please, if you're listening to that, it's so important because if you're hangry, hello, that, that's a new term, hungry and, and low blood sugar, and you're going to get a bit cross. You don't want to be hangry at your kids or hangry at your partner or even hangry at yourself just because you missed a meal. So let's get mm. shit together. The biology is, is within our control. We've done it for decades, literally a, <laughs> a lot of decades between us. Yeah, that's right. And uh, we can control it. And as Holly said, Oleolatin is control the controllables. That's why I've got this here. Come back from the shop. Yeah. Literally, I know I'm going to be training after this. So I've got protein and ketones because I need to be my best when I train. So control yeah. the controllables. I just can't say that enough. And then where I got the idea for today's topic of being proactive. If, if, if those things happen, and they, so somebody falls off the cliff mentally and they come see you or they fall off from grace and they come see you or they come see me because their partner's been there's a home invasion or whatever i, I don't like mentioning that horrible stuff I, I like to do the violent stuff in the courses but some bad events happened neither of us can undo those for them gary yeah we can't that's undo right that. it's happened there's no justice there's a legal system there's no justice yep. justice is undoing the event so I'd much rather someone come see me beforehand or come see you beforehand and get these skills so that that fall isn't so bad or that actually was just a guy knocking the door rather than a home invasion sort of thing. We can minimise the, the stressors, the threats, the, the situations that are out of our control. Yeah, and, and look, one of the things that you, you pointed out there, especially the preparing to you take a drink and, and you talk about controlling the controllables, that... I just came off an interview um, last week where they asked me about my recovery from mental health issues and how I used physical training to do that. And uh, probably a lot of people won't know that but the first elements of my coming through mental health battles was actually physical training. It was something that I'd always done in my life. It was something that I was trained in my, my degrees in health science and but I also but what I said to her was it was one thing that I could control I couldn't control all the stories about me I couldn't in some respects control some parts of my mind I couldn't control what my work was doing I couldn't control my partner I couldn't control any of those things but movement and what I put in my body 
is 100% up to me. And whilst we might not want to believe that, we might want to think, I've got to pick the kids up and it's raining and there's other issues. You can choose to move and you can choose to eat healthily. You can choose to take the right amount of water and you can choose to go to sleep at a particular time, or at least go to bed or get some support for your sleep. Yep. One of the things I found was that gave me an element of control. And once I start from that element of control, I can build control in other areas of my life because like we were talking about before, it's a transferable skill. Yep. Once I learn this level of control here, I just transfer the skill to the next part. And for me, the next part was, so sleep was the fourth element there for me. And then the next part was a routine. And then it was mindfulness and mindset. And, and then it was cold showers. And if you're not in the cold showers, get yourself in the cold showers and, yep. and ice baths. Hey, you're going to find out a little bit about yourself there. And, and so the, the skill became transferable. It was no longer I had to relearn a new skill. I just had to transfer the skill I learned. So regaining or gaining some of that level of control is a very important part. And like I said, the two of the areas that you have absolute control over, for the most part, ex excusing people that don't have physical control over their body, but the two areas that you have control over are your movement, and what you put in your body. And if you get that, start there. Go and see how, what does Jess call us? Is she just Jess Nutrition? Jess what? How about that? It's the way the world Go and happens. see Jess Wilson, Mrs. How Not to Die Guy. <laughs> but, that, but if you don't know what to do, find someone to help you. Google it for free, it doesn't really matter. But if we start to take control, if, and we give over control of everything in our life to, to other things, not even other people. We give it over to other things. We give it over to the weather. We give it over to a job. We give it over to social media. We give it over to gaming. We're giving it over to things. We're not even giving it over to people that we care about. If you start to take control back, you can really change your entire life just by starting with one. I love that control. I, that. I interviewed... Um, Dean Stott. No, that's the wrong way to say it. I interviewed mm. Alana Stott, who was married to Dean Stott. I was about to say Dean Stott's wife. Oh. Derogatory. Alana Stott, who yeah. is a most extraordinary member of the British Empire. She's not a dame yet, but she's getting a medal from the king. So, and she actually said, about, talked to me about how to almost budget your time. When you think, I haven't got enough time for that. When you actually work mm. out the minutes and the time of the day and how long does it take you to brush your teeth and how long does it take you to do dinner, and we did it for the week because you're busy with kids and it was brilliant. It was like, okay, the pressure's off because you're doing slow cook in the morning here. Dinner's made by the time you mm. get home. That's an hour free. And that's controlling the controllables. That's being realistic, not losing yeah. um, 30 minutes twice a day for social media scrolling when I went on to do a post. I went on to put something right. on and I, you know, I'm scrolling 30 minutes. And it was really telling, empowering, eye-opening how much time you can lose. And all those things you said, if we're giving ourselves over to things and not people, they're just taking it. Those things are taking your time and our time is, is all we've got, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And, and just on that, for those that are still with us, I can probably give you a, um, uh, a story about how I run my life to explain how much time you actually have right. in, in a day. If, if you don't, and again, some of this is about taking control and not being mindless about your time. So there's 24 hours in a day. I have four, four key areas of my life. I think there's four key areas of everybody's life. That's my health, which is more my physical components, my wealth or my financial freedom or something to do with business or money, my relationships my, my with my wife, with my kids, with my friends and all that sort of stuff. And myself, which is my emotional, mental, spiritual health as well. There's those four elements. Pretty much anything can fall into one of those brackets. There's 24 hours in a day, and I wipe out seven for sleep, right? I, I give myself seven hours for sleep. I, I have a little bit of a gap, so sometimes I, can, I have more if I need it. Sometimes I have less if I'm busy. But seven, I think, is a good average for me to aim for. So that means that I've got 17 hours left of the day. I focus 13 hours of my day on one of those four key areas. 
health, wealth, relationships, or self. 13 hours of a day. That could include work for some people. If people work eight hours a day, that's fine. If you work eight hours a day, there's still five hours a day that you can devote to health, wealth, relationship, and self. Excuse me. The thing that I find fascinating about that 13 hours is that that leaves me with four hours to do whatever the hell I want. I could scroll on social media for four hours and still have 13 productive hours in the day. Yeah, and wow. yeah, I guarantee you that most people out there don't believe they have 13 productive hours a day. But if you start to manage your time against some level of purpose or some level of vision or some process, and you allot that time, even randomly, it doesn't have to be like at this hour I'm going to do that and at this hour I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. You could do 13 hours. What I find is in that four hours, I'm typically working on my health. The four hours I have off, I'm typically working on my health, my wealth, my relationships with myself because yeah. I like doing that stuff. Yeah. I might scroll for 20 minutes. I might put a post up and scroll for a bit, but it falls into that four hours of time where I do nothing or I, I'm driving somewhere or anything like that. There's a lot of time in the day. If you sleep for seven hours, there is a sleep for eight hours, doesn't matter, sleep for ten. There is a lot of time in the day if you are conscious about how you spend your time. Yes. Typically where we go wrong is we're not conscious about it. And the second place that a lot of people go wrong is believing that they're not a morning person. So they stay up late. And I guarantee you, 90% of people, 99% of people, by the time it gets to 8 o'clock, you are probably not doing anything productive. It's Netflix, it's scrolling, it's sitting on the couch, it's eating Cheetos, it's whatever. There are a small percentage of people out there that are productive after 8 o'clock, but it's not you. Get your ass up early and work properly and consciously through the day. It's all about being conscious. You've got so much time, so much time. But if you're not conscious about it, you forget. It just gets to the end of the day and you're like, oh, I don't really know what happened today. That's just because you were not conscious about your day. That's all. Not that you didn't have time, it's just you weren't conscious. It really is. I guess mindfulness is a term that I don't even know what the hell that thing means, but I know what it takes to focus and I'm being mindful at the yeah. moment. I got all these terms, but I see that successful people do them naturally. And yeah, I was saying today, on the show, being a good parent makes you a better person. There's only one key word in the whole statement, and it's a good parent. Yeah. I'm trying to teach those things to, to uh, my child, you know, passing those things on, which then makes me self-reflect. You know, they talk about gratitude and gratitude journal. Again, that's Swahili to me, literally. Mm. That's my head. My ears may be, and it just deflects off. But I know that at night, I literally, okay, what was the favorite part of your day? This, this is what we yeah. do with our floor time. What did you do well today? And what's one thing you'd improve on? So straight away, that's actually gratitude, if, whatever words you want to use. But it's really yeah. helpful because it's like, I did do something good today. And actually, I did make a mistake today. And I'll, I'll work on that next time. And just by bringing it out, especially with someone else, I think it's helpful. Yeah, gosh, just, I guess. We, we touched on that earlier, though, Damien, that whatever you call it, doesn't really matter. It's a perspective that that you have. If you say to yourself, I don't know what mindfulness is, so I'm not going to worry about it, then you're probably not going to experience it regardless of what you call it. Yeah. It really doesn't matter if, I don't know, if you, if you call it Timbuktu, it, it's irrelevant what you call the thing. Mm -hmm. and, and But if you experience a level of presence, the chances are you're being mindful, right? Like, but when people are exercising, if you're training hard, you're probably mindful because you're totally immersed in your training. If you're listening to music, if you're drawing, if you're coloring in, that's mindfulness, right? Mindfulness, by definition, is having a full mind of the practice that you're engaged in. But again, where people get mixed up is, oh, I can't lay there and meditate. That's all right, you don't have to. And I can't write down gratitude. Okay, but tell me what was good about you that, right? And, exactly. and I have the same thing, right? What's one thing that was good at school today? You know what, or what's something good that happened to someone else? Just reframing, and you know, it, again, it's irrelevant what you call it. But if you are more positive and present focused, 
presence focused and positive, you've probably got mindfulness and gratitude, which are, we know they're two key elements to success. There, there is almost zero successful people in the world that don't have some mindful and or gratitude process in their life. Absolutely. There's, there's none. It just doesn't exist. Absolutely. Absolutely. I talked with Nick Goldsmith, who runs Hidden Valley Bushcraft, and uh, he talked about, say, a sports person that suddenly is forced into retirement. They turned all those dials when they're training, when they're doing those things. Their dials of endorphins, their, di their dials of, of gratitude, their dials of flow state, all those things. Just because they're stopping, they come off the dais and they're stopping the game or whatever they're playing, they're still going to turn those dials. And it's important that you do find those ways to do it. And, and like you said, it, it might just be in the gym. I, I realize that I've been lifting. I did the maths. It's, it's, it's a bloody long time. 37 years. When I'm doing bicep girls, I'm not concentrating on anything else. I'm, I'm meditating. It's, yeah. it's moving right. meditation. We just want to throw some terms up. And it's just, I'm not, haven't got ear, ear pods on like they do in, in the gyms and, and I haven't got my, I don't go check my phone between sets and things. I'm just, yeah. but I'm not, I'm not, a, yeah. I'm not a stoic. I'm not a monk. I just, but that's just what I'm doing because I'm focused on something. Are, are you Australia and New Zealand's answer to David Goggins? Oh, no. no I want you to state it here. I want you to state it here for anyone that's watching right now. How not to die guy is claiming to be Australia's David Goggins. <laughs> There's zero chance of that. That dude's crazy, but he's, he's changed the paradigm as well, which is amazing. Uh, but yeah. actually, uh, if you're saying if you if you're going to go there, so for the <laughs> listeners, David Goggins is world famous for completing his his bud selection, his Navy Seal selection with a broken leg from memory. Well, the uh, broken tibia, I think, is the lower leg. Yeah, turns, uh, yeah. stretch fractures in his lower leg. Yeah, turns, I've been, I've been running, doing interval training out there. There we go. Training, trying to do a Martin Bayfield. I've let you post on a, on a, on a There picture. he is again, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> claiming to be Australia's David Goggin. Two years I've been running running like a maniac on a broken leg. And uh, yeah, it turned out... It yeah, Goggin's uh, only ran for six weeks on one. He's yeah, not. Exactly. He's, yeah, exactly. He's touching the sides. <laughs> <laughs> I might <laughs> cut this and send it to him. Deer with a sore tooth. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to cut this. How is the leg, by the way? Uh, it's here. Mate, I'm, I'm seven days out of moon boot. Thank you. I'm um, doing my rehab every couple of hours, and, uh, and just doing what the physios say. And I'm looking at being back on the on the fire trucks. And let's see, in about a month from now, about four weeks from now. And it's process, right? Like this again. This is the same stuff we're talking about. You have a process to follow, and if you follow that process, you will get the result at the end. And and whether again, whether it's physical, mental, self awareness, physical space awareness, if you follow the process to get better, you'll get better. Well, if you don't, a course of action. I, I, I like that. Hope is not a course of action. That's that's what I've seen on your your post a few times. It's it's true. It's not. Too many of us are, are leaving our lives literally up to hope. Lives in, in your sense, whether they. You come under attack. Lives, in my sense, whether they destroy their lives or even, unfortunately, take the the, the ultimate decision. Uh, there's lives being destroyed by people sticking to hope when we have more control than than perhaps we'd like to admit. Yeah, and look, it's out there. Gosh, I jumped on YouTube this morning after the show. I had a link from the spotter up on uh, our podcast. So look at that. And what did I see? I saw my friend Eric Miyaris. He's basically Jason Bourne. And I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. And he's on the Black Rifle Coffee podcast with uh, Mike Glover. Big hitters. Eric's first ever podcast was with me. And what was so great was the reason he came out of the shadows, like literally in the shadows as Jason mm. Bourne, was because two of his friends... In one month, it might have even been two weeks, a two-week period, took their own lives. And yeah. his passion is to get the message out, get the message out there about mental health. And it's out there from people like us. Hmm. I, I was talking to, like I said, the Michael Kachina from the, the show this morning, and 
his psychologist, the third one, because you go through a few, you got to find out who you yep. resonate with. Correct. Was an ex-state trooper, F FBI, whatever they are, and then became FBI profiler because he got some psychologist skills, and now he's a psychologist. Speaks the same hmm. language. What I'm loving yeah. now, and I think Ollie might have said it, or possibly Dan Dan Pronk or someone else around those lines, is the next version of psycho the next era of psychologists actually going to be people like you and I that have gone through that upskilled. Harry Moffat, SASR. A yep. clinical psychologist, I, I believe, and they're actually going to be able to help this generation of mental health, especially with the males and, and the, the people that won't ask for help, first responders, police, soldiers, and so on. And I'm, I'm really hopeful and optimistic about how that's going. Yeah, well, I mean, I speak mostly to men. The, the name's in my business. It's also in my gender, so it probably helps. But primarily, I speak to performance people or alpha personalities. So it doesn't matter, man or woman, in, in the police force, in the military, CEOs, business people, athletes. It's very difficult to ask for help. But also, to be fair, in my view, the, the therapy model has let a lot of that type of personality down over the years as well. Because if you're, if you're an alpha-style personality, if you're a, a, a high performer, Typically, you're a problem solver. You're an action taker. And the entire therapy model is around talking, support, and comfort, which are important, but they, they're only part of the story for somebody who is keen to take action. Show me the problem, explain it to me how it works, and let me go and fix it. And... I, I think we have been letting down that element of the story for, for a long time, and it's, it's on both sides. That's because we haven't seen a lot of people who have come through it and share their story, and, and now we're seeing a lot more voices that resonate with alpha personalities. And it doesn't affect your masculinity. It doesn't affect your performance. In fact, again, I would argue that working on these things actually improves your performance. It makes you tougher. It makes you more resilient. All of those definitions that we would try to espouse to as an alpha high performer, working on this stuff actually makes you better in that role. It makes you better individually inside yourself, stronger, tougher, more resilient. And I think it's important that we are starting to see more voices that resonate and I've said this a number of times. I wasn't going to go and see somebody in linen pants and sandals. I had to talk about my issues so I could get a cuddle. It just wasn't going to work for me. And until I built my own system, I didn't find it a lot out there. I've had good psychologists, but even then, still only dealing with one part of the issue. That's how did I get here? High performers want to know how the fuck do I get out? Can I say that on Instagram? How the hell can I get out? That's that's what high performers want to know. That, sure, tell me how I got here, but how do I get out? What do I have to do to get out? That's what I'm interested in. Uh, and and I do think you. that is an arm of psychology that's growing. It, it's not only you, Gary. I agree. It's great to see this, that that's growing. Literally, his username is Resilience101. Nick Caldwell of the Mill Gym. They prepare, so former SASR, many years. Gulf War II veteran, former Fort Commando. So a special forces operator and gone on to own a, a high-performing gym. That gym, their main role was to prepare people for special forces selection and police tactical selection. And they've had a 100% had pass rate for the people they've sent on it. Now, he states in, in one of the shows that he uses uh, a psychologist for performance enhancement now. Once mm -hmm. I've come back to zero, now we can step up. All those words you were saying, resilience, toughness, all those things, it's, it's you on that side of the country saying it, and it's Nick over here from s tough, tough places. He's using it now in mm -hmm. 2023. After he left the unit in, in 2012 era, uh, after Gulf War in Afghan, and that's a completely different word. Performance enhancement, absolutely. Yeah, I guess it comes down to proactiveness again. It just sums up what the yep. subject was today. It's being proactive, not only in fixing yourself, 
mending yourself, but let's prepare. I guess that I was saying prepare for the worst, hope for the best, but let's be prepared and and have tools available. And it's, it's great to be able to share these sort of things with, with us. We never know the subject and we resonate on it all, all no. the time, but it's great. Yeah, and, and look, I, I think it's important to point out to people too that to enhance performance isn't just what the dictionary or the social media definition of peak performance is. It can be to make you a better father, a better mother, to your performance in that realm, better at your work, better as a son, as a daughter, better at the school canteen. It, it really doesn't matter. Performance enhancement and high performance. High performance is relative only to the role that you are in. Yeah. There's not high performance and because I see athletes at high performance that if I'm not an athlete, I can't be a high performer because if I'm a mechanic, I can be a high performing mechanic. Yes. And right? if, if I'm a mother, I can be a high performing mother. Yeah. High, high performance is not, is not siphoned off to particular industries. It's everybody, wherever you are, and performance enhancement relates to you. It doesn't just relate to athletes and business people and CEOs and police and military. It relates to everybody. And yeah, I think it's I think it's an important point maybe to end on because I know you've got to work you have to get to, and if you don't, you're probably going to be jumping out of your skin with that um, uh, with that real ketones Australia uh, product you're probably drinking there. Yeah. Um, I saw the bags the other day. Is, is it is that a bag of powder? Uh, I know this is off topic, so no, apologies no, no, to anyone that's watching yeah, this. So the, the bag is a, a bag of 30 sachets, so it comes in a sachet amount. Ah, okay. Amounts, a 30 day amounts as well as the, the 10 so day boxes. The, the sachets are in that bag, or yeah. it's yeah. a big bag of powder and I scoop it out? Big bag of, of sachets, big bag of sachets. Okay, these sachets? Yeah, that's the ones, the exact one. Yep. The, the littler ones, yeah? Yeah. No, well, that's, that's not allowed. I'm not supported by real ketones Australia, but I, I do take them. Check out how not to die guy for that stuff. Uh, so I drink, um, I drink this for two reasons. One, I've got the workout coming up, so the protein's going in, and that, that's a no-brainer. That's literally a bit of science that's had protein during the workout or after. But I had to have the ketones because I literally had breakfast at 6.30, I think, after their show this morning. I got to stay switched on, keep up with a brainy guy like you, so I wanted that, that <laughs> brain to work as well. I, I, Look, I have my ketones the first. I have 500 mils of water in my ketones after my cold shower in the morning. It's the second thing I do after I get out of bed because I don't eat typically till 10 or 11 o'clock. And one of the things I do find with the ketones is that it it helps stave off that hunger for a little bit longer as well. But no yeah, that's no good gear. Brain, no drop off. No, that's exactly right. I'm still going strong now, although I have eaten now. It's two o'clock here, so I've had one meal. But but we should do this more, mate. I, I think, look, whether people enjoy it or not, I enjoy it. It's a good chance for us to catch up. And perhaps, like we said before, there's something in our conversation that people might pick up and we might find a better way to do it or, or keep doing it this way and maybe be able to share it across multiple platforms or, or whatever. But let's, let's get to blunt tools together. I know they said a, a different word there for blunt, but two blunt tools together a, a few more times and, and see where the magic happens. Yeah, man, let's do it. It's, yeah. it's important to get that message out. If just one person here has really done our job, it's not a throwaway comment. Uh, and I had some feedback from the last one. It was, it was great. It was really nice to, to hear. So, yeah, man, let's make it happen. Yeah, yeah appreciate it, mate. I enjoyed that workout. I'm done for my workouts today. I've got other types of sessions to do. We'll chat soon and uh, I'll post this up and yeah if you did like it if you're still here at the end or you just watched at the end send us a look and some comments and maybe some topics that you want to talk about whether it's mental health physical health nutrition we might have to bring Jess on looking after yourself in, the, in public how to stay safe out there with my 46 years and 48 for you 49 how old are you? I turn 50 in about two months time okay your 49 years and my 46 years, we've probably seen a few things throughout the time. So if we don't know the answer, we'll certainly make it up. I'm happy to help. Thanks, guys. It's been great to talk to you. Cheers, mate. Enjoy the workout. Take care, brother. Thank you. See ya. See you, mate.